Malolele, kia ora tato. My name is Peter Dawika Vailima Joseph Menata. I am a cis queer, pansexual, ethically non monogamous man. My pronouns are he, him. I am Tongan Māori. My Tongan family hails from the villages of Haafakatolo and Niafu. And I was born and raised in Aotearoa, no here Tamaki Makoto aho. Uh, ko Tōrere Te Maunga, ko Fau Te Awa, ko Te Rarawa Te Iwi, ko Menata Toku Fano, ko Pita Toku Ingwa, no reira Tēnā Koutou, Tēnā Koutou, Tēnā Koutou katoa. What's most present and what I would like to share uh, around is um, language, eating and tattoos. Currently I am trying to learn my native tongues. Um, I'm not fluent in them. I can understand on a basic level like bits and pieces of conversation but um, you know there's a reason why I don't know my language um, and and part of that is is colonization and the way that shows up is that you know my language has been kind of devalued uh, and I didn't really see any value in, in learning it and you know there was many opportunities for, for me to learn it growing up uh, my family didn't really speak it to um, they spoke to me um, and it was spoken in tidbits throughout the household but um, not on a level where I was able to gain fluency part of that is the um, the level of assimilation equating to your value and success in modern society and so kind of dropping the language and leaving it behind um, or just wanting their children um, to do to do well and have a better future so it's not necessarily something out of malice that they didn't want to teach me my language but um, you know it, it's affected me greatly because um, it, it has disabled me to be able to connect with my own people um, a lot of conversations that I've had with family um, I don't really get to talk to that much um, because they'll try to talk to me in Tongan and um, I, I'll say sorry I don't really I don't speak Tongan like oh okay and then I don't really get to engage because their English isn't that good I can't even speak my own native tongue because it's been stripped away and devalued and especially with uh, you know the missionaries coming through to the islands and uh, making us conform and adhere to these other religions and lifestyles that make sense for other people from other lands but cause an out of balance relationship with our people to our own lands. I just feel like a big part of, of that has been missing for me and especially with a, a resurgence um, in today's world with like you know reclaiming your roots. Uh, indigenous people actually getting a voice and, and a seat at the table even though we're still kind of fighting um, once we get there. I have felt empowered um, more and more today to reclaim my tongue um, and knowing that the monetary value like doesn't even matter and it's really kind of revolving around like capitalism uh, with like you know the languages that I learned because I've I've learned other languages uh, I probably speak like a shit ton more like Polish than my, my native tongue and that's because of you know like these associations like oh like I would love to learn like Russian or like you know um, you should learn Mandarin because you know that's like financial business like good financial literacy you can like mess around in the market it's really hard to put the Tongan language on a pedestal or like find the value in it when it's like well you get to talk to your family also just better connect with um, with with my mom um, I mean yeah she speaks English but also I, I, I do feel like a, a shift in energy and I just feel like I get to really experience uh, her at her most authentic when she's speaking um, in her native tongue um, I notice uh, a tonal change and just a, a feeling of more cell in her body being able to connect with, with that would be really awesome um, for our relationship and then also just like <laughs> be able to show up at family functions and be like yo what up to everybody and like you know um, speak and, and, and be able to you know embrace and be embraced uh, by everybody and not really have to live in my conversations to like the younger people because they speak English or you know being able to tap into the elders and the wisdom and uh, my ancestors um, you know passed on or, or still, still around but that would mean a lot 
Um, so those are the ways that I would love to be able to continue on on my journey and be able to celebrate and, and embrace my, my culture. And it's also just like a great, you know, <laughs> mental exercise uh, to be able to, you know, go between between the languages and stuff. I think I used to hold like um, just like a low regard for people that didn't really speak English that well. And I've definitely, you know, learned and un, um, unlearned that valuing system and <laughs> learned that like, yo, that's fucking dope that like, you know, your English might not be that great, but you're literally like, you know, you're able to speak this language like, you know, fluently and like still process and function and like you know make it happen and survive in wherever you are my, my values have shifted and I'm realizing more and more the importance of like being able to reconnect to my people reconnect to my lands um, with eating um, so in Polynesian culture and Tongan culture you know one of the ways that you show love is through eating like a lot like you know if you love the dish you, you eat a lot um, that's how you tell the person like your food was delicious I'm gonna have some more I used to do that a lot and I would eat past my hunger signals um, I started like you know as I was getting older realizing that man I feel I don't really feel good in my body um, I feel out of my body um, and trying to reevaluate my reevaluate my relationship to eating um, and it's really difficult when you've got uh, diet culture just like normalized and running rampant and all of the messages that are received about how your body should look how much you should eat what you should eat um, and being Polynesian and having these massive feasts of delicious food where you're encouraged to eat by family and then you also get comments from family like oh you're skinny you should eat or um, you're a big boy eat or like you know they really like again not from a place of malice but of a place of like love and like trying to nurture and take care and stuff and it's really hard to keep on like you know eating past those hunger, hunger signals to show that you love when there's like an insurmountable amount of food you take plates to take home to other family members that maybe weren't able to come or like you know leftovers i mean it's like leftovers for like a week like you have that big feast and that's like pretty much good um uh, for for the whole week reevaluated my own relationship to food um, and I'm really like, you know, paying attention to my hugging signals and I just eat till I'm full and, and that's it. And that's been really challenging to come back into the, the family, um, uh, nucleus of like people will tell me, Oh, eat, grab another plate, you know, um, when like I'm actually full and having to, to stand up for myself or just like shut down and like not know what to say. Cause I'm like just playing it off. Like, Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. I know of people, uh, within you know the, the the therapist community and like mental health community that works specifically with uh, eating disorders and disordered eating and um, with that exposure and those those friends and stuff I've been able to kind of re-examine and reevaluate my own relationship to food um, and you know hold a little bit more compassion and, and awareness and sensitivity to you know maybe my language um, that comes up around the, the the dining table I was at a social function and there was somebody who was trying to make light talk um, who was you know this old white man and he you know came up and it's kind of like not locker room talk but it was definitely like like I uh, I expect you to you know put out a good portion there on your plate and take care of this just having these expectations that follow me because I'm uh, I'm a Polynesian guy and I'm and I'm big and people just assuming oh he's probably a big eater because um, I've seen it where like that actually um, affects the way businesses view us in Auckland where I'm from uh, some all you can eat like buffet kind of type places where they you know they put time restrictions or they say like explicitly like no like island family or like I don't know it's just it's just hella like messed up or like they cap they cap it out like um, because you know we've been known for this or and that's just like the expectation that just always follows it's especially because yeah even if nobody really says it I know that I, I can feel it you know I'm sensitive to other people's energies uh, 2018 I'd, I'd saved up like 2k for a, for a tattoo and and uh, I'd been in contact with uh, not my cousin but uh, a cousin of one of my cousins and uh, amazing tattoo artist who's Maori and um, so 
Trump was still president at the time, and uh, we've been in contact. He made it into SFO, landed, sent me a message. Hey, I'm going to be at your place in like, you know, three hours. I'm going to drop off some equipment. Um, and then I didn't hear from him. He got put into detention and sent back to New Zealand. He filled out the form that says, have you been arrested for this, this, or this? And he hadn't been arrested for it. Um, but they did some digger deep, uh, deeper digging and they found out that he had been arrested at one point and that was good enough for them to say, you're not welcome here. Um, and you know, keep in mind, he is this person of color. He is um, this big Maori man and he's got tattoos. Um, so like easy targeting, easy picking. And it just felt really shitty on the inside. Besides doing my tattoo, he was meant to go to New York for this tattoo expo which he was you know being featured at and he didn't he didn't get to go there you know I, very particular i didn't want to just go to some polynesian tattoo place and be like hey dude like the maori one it's more than just like a cool looking design within the designs within the patterns each tribe has their own like you know specific patterns or or tribes and they all have their own meanings um so if people are to you know be like oh i like that that looks sick can you do that on me like you're literally stealing somebody else's story, somebody else's family, somebody's, you know, lineage um, and information about somebody's identity that isn't yours and just plastering it on. And that's why um, you can't just pick designs that you like and be like that one. You know, there has been this resurgence and revival of tattoo in uh, Polynesian cultures where for a long time it was heavily stigmatized uh, by Western culture and, and their views and um, frowned upon, especially Tamoko, which is the facial tattoos and just people associating their own meanings to it, whether it's gang affiliation or um, just like that we're trying to be intimidating, which, you know, the, the Tamoko, the facial tattoos accentuate the the facial features the tamako is like crazy like loaded with um cultural significance like back in the day that was kind of like your cv like your resume like um from witnessing or seeing somebody's tamako you could tell um their identity their social status um their story um like some real some real basics uh kind of like eyelids down is kind of more the physical plane like you know maybe um they'll tell the story of like you're a gardener then eyelids up is more because it's closer to the heavens is more um to do with the spiritual realm have a connection and and ability to to talk with the ancestors and stuff like that would be kind of represented they weren't necessarily um fully like symmetrical the same because your left side of the other face was representing your your mother's side um, because it's closest to the heart and then on the right side would be your father's side so if it, if it was completely symmetrical then then it would be like you know a problem because you'd be like oh i think you're like <laughs> re related because it was um you know the carriage like your your family lines and stuff you know maori for the longest time before settlers came in it's not a written language so the way that we expressed uh, our language and told stories was through the expression of the, the facial tattoos and the markings um, and also through just you know uh, our corded ororos and, and talking to each other and um, the stories which you know because we didn't write it down people kind of off as folklore or not true and stuff but you know we've been doing it for thousands of years and we're, we're here and we've survived I feel ready um, to to take that on not necessarily full, fully traditional because traditionally speaking the way that it was done um, they would use a uh, albatross bone with albatross bird because uh, the, the bone is like really strong and, and thick and they would literally uh, carve the tattoo into your skin um, and so yeah they would use uh, ink which was like either like uh, a caterpillar and like maybe some kind of like ash uh, carve into the skin and then you know put the ink in and, and set it in and cauterize it and um, it was an honor to, to have the tattoos it's definitely still work to be done but it has become more and more widely accepted it's beautiful for me to see in parliament and government in New Zealand uh, Maori people with 
tamoko with the the male and the female. The male is usually the full facial, and um, the female is usually just the the moko kawai, which is just on the chin. Um, and the reason why they don't do like the, the full face is because you know it is a lot of pain, um, and the whole reasoning is because you know they already enjoy a lot, a lot of pain already. Um, from just the the beauty of, of giving life and giving birth healing from that scar and, and knowing that the tattoos don't mean that I'm a bad person or that like you know um, say this or that about me uh, which has been hard to overcome because uh, my mother I do receive a lot of like internalized uh, racism and, and colonization with with her you know with tattoos and just like not really feeling like I should get it or like it like it's gonna ruin my body or uh, which you know f f it's totally understandable with you know each different cultures having their own meanings and I think um, I have heard both like in the Tongan culture that for some parts it was to like identify prisoners it's been uh, a way to reclaim our culture and have it physically show on our body but it's really hard to do that and want to do that when there is policies written into work like no visible tattoos or um, even there was somebody in my high school who got expelled because of the tattoo that they had that was visible there are real life penalties and consequences to to doing so like not getting a job because of it or um, yeah, just getting like stinky views. Um, so a few of the ways that I'm ready to embrace and celebrate these scars um, that I've held. Uh, currently, I've got a family reunion that is coming up like 2022, 20, 2023, like at the end of the year. And um, so I'm gonna be going back to Aotearoa. And uh, while I'm going back there, it's a great opportunity for me to um, meet up with an artist and finally get the tattoo that I um, wanted to get back in 2018. It's a symbol of like me embracing um, and accepting uh, with like open arms my, my culture and I'm, I'm ready for it especially you know getting it done while I'm back in Aotearoa um, in my homelands <clears throat> and being able to reconnect with my roots uh, in a visible way wherever I am in the world. The, has been kind of like back and forth with uh, with one of my best friends about like whether <clears throat> my sleeve like ends like at my wrist or whether it goes to my hand and I want it to go to my hand um, and you know part of that hesitation was just because of you know like work related stuff like oh you might not get the job or and <clears throat> it's something that I've been going back and forth in my head and you know I think what I've come to is that like I don't want to work for a place that it's not gonna you know fully embrace me I don't want to work for somebody that's like well we like you but just like just look like the rest of us please I believe in myself and I and I value myself and, and what I bring um, and you know because my tattoo goes to my hand doesn't it change my ability to do my job um, and so that's something that I'm also holding it's kind of silly and one of those things that we've hold on to in terms of like a value system of like uh, like dress codes in general which is a whole other thing just knowing the value in your own culture um, that you know each culture is, is different and unique and special and it's something to take pride in especially you know when you go into the forest um, when you go out into nature the beauty is like all of the different trees all of the different flowers it'd be boring as fuck if like just the same trees you're just looking at the same trees just like you know how they have in the bible like these cool like messages from the stories there's like uh there's there's great stories and lessons from um the the worldview that your culture holds and um especially re regarding the things that i talked about like language language has been like uh, I'm still in the process of learning my native tongue, but it's such a great way to unlock your culture, unlock the relationships to your people, <clears throat> to your family, especially. Your culture is beautiful, your language is important, um, not just, you know, for being able to, to, to connect, but for all of those people that were, you know, stripped of their language. My people weren't able to speak the language for uh, a long time. They got the language beat out of them. Um, so it really is like a privilege to be able to speak the language, speak it freely um, and to, to connect back, back in, um, to tap back into your roots, to your root system, your, you know, your familial root system, your land root system. Um, one thing that I'll also add in is, is if you are trying to like connect with, uh, with indigenous people or just, you know, people of color, just BIPOC people, I feel like people 
put up these unintentional barriers when they're trying to connect with us from a place of like oh scared of like saying the wrong thing or whatever which i get but also like you know just you know ask us like how we're doing like what's going up in our life and stuff but most recent experience where like i've i've been like why do you do that uh, was with uh these people who were just trying to connect with me um through the stereotypes of my identity um whether it's like oh i'll talk to this person i'll have i'll start up a little conversation and you know islanders big eaters oh yeah yeah i'll say that i'll say something around that or um uh recently like somebody was like oh so you used to play rugby and i was like yeah yeah and then in my head i was like oh maybe this person played rugby we're gonna talk about that and then he was like so you know the haka and i was like oh, obviously we love like sharing our culture and um celebrating our culture there's nuanced ways and just i don't know better ways of like asking about it um that don't really like involve you having to use tropes to try and like connect with us i would love to be able to talk like haka with you but not if you're just like oh yeah i love it when they do the the ah and, the, uh, and i'm like all right just connect with us like like regular people you can just ask us like what's going on with our lives you don't have to like try and be like oh yeah you're probably gonna eat that huh <laughs>